Uh, all right, uh, here we are today is May 10th, and we're starting a little bit late. Uh, today's um, Let's Talk. Um, so today's going to be probably well over an hour. Um, unfortunately, it's not possible to keep all these talks to, 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 to short things. So um, first I wanted to say I wanted to make a, uh, an apology to um, uh, some uh, devotees who are out there who have been listening and tuned in. And uh, it's, it's obvious that uh, my presentation and some of the things uh, and the way I have expressed a few things up to this point have, well, maybe if not offended, it has certainly uh, disturbed some individuals or was dissatisfying to those individuals. So I would just like to uh, sincerely say without too much elaboration, uh, I'm sorry if I've disturbed anyone. Um, and uh, going forward, I'll try to make my presentations a little more um, judicious is one way of looking at it. A little, uh, I'll try to keep from going off the rails, which I sometimes do, and, and getting a little too uh, emotionally carried away with the point I'm trying to make and trying to make my point in the way I, the way I often do. I'll, I'll try to stick, uh, be a little bit more reserved in my uh presentation. Uh, however, for what I what I believe to be the proper siddhanta, which I have which I um, have heard from my uh, guru and from my gurus, uh, namely from Srila Prabhupada, from Srila Sridharmaraj, and from Srila Bhakti Pramod Puri Goswami, well, I, I'm not going to deviate from that. I'm not going to water that down just to make everyone happy. So we got into a bit of controversy there on the uh, absolute and relative position of the Acharya. So this, of course, raised uh, some controversy or some concerns. Actually, what I thought were uh, criticisms uh, were later expressed as not really criticisms, but concerns, and therefore my apology uh, for the way I've misunderstood my critics. However, uh, please don't misunderstand me. I have no enmity uh, with, with anyone out there listening or not, not listening. All right, so let's try to move on from there. So um, I, had, I had sort of thought, okay, let's move on. There are lots of topics. Uh, but again, reverting back to something that Goswami, that you said uh, in the very beginning here of uh, last week when we started this broadcast program, uh, you pointed out that if Guru Tattva isn't understood properly, then this is going to lead to so many misunderstandings or, you know, incomplete understandings and wrong understandings as regards other aspects of the Gaudiya Siddhantas. I think that's a correct understanding of what you were saying, is it? Yes. Agiri, is that right? Yeah. So right. when you first said that, I was like, yeah, okay, well, anyway, and then I realized later on, actually, that's uh, quite more profound than what I uh, first understood his point to be. All right, so the main topic of today is not the absolute and relative position of the Acharya, but it is connected. And... Uh, this topic has a, has an opportunity uh, ha, has the chance of really ruffling some feathers uh, way more than than the first discussions about uh, relative and absolute position of guru. Today's topic is about omniscience. Is the guru omniscient? And when we discuss omniscience. The words trikalagya, past, present, and future, uh, come into play. They, they become part of the conversation. Guru is omniscient. Well, what does that mean? Well, the guru knows past, present, and future. Um, so this controversy first came up, I don't know, I was about close, it's getting close to 15 years ago. When a group of 
Well, it depends. The group themselves doesn't refer to themselves as Sahajiyas, but that's the way it goes. Mayavadis don't refer to themselves as Mayavadis either. But a group of Sahajiyas in Vrindavan who were uh, influencing a number of, uh, a, a, a significant number of Western devotees, uh, as they continue to do today, and as numerous groups of what Gaudiya Sampradaya considers heretics or sahajiyas, uh, these groups, and there are many of them today, they continue to uh, influence uh, devotees uh, in the in the widespread Hare Krishna movement from around the world, influence them in the way they practice, in the way they focus on what is their prayojana, what is the ultimate goal of bhakti, and how to achieve that, and all these things. They're not just one or two; there are multiple, multiple uh, groups with uh, uh, with with philosophical understandings and practical practices that are in opposition or in contrast to uh, the teachings of the Gaudiya Sampradaya, particularly when I say Gaudiya, I mean in the line of Bhakti Vinod, Bhakti Siddhanta, Bhakti Siddhanta's followers, and uh, particularly uh, our, Guru, our Guru Maharaj and Param Guru Maharaj, uh, A.C. Bhakti Vinod Swami Prabhupada. So, um, this particular group, which is uh, which is referred to uh, by some people, although that's not their official name, is the Putinese. Uh, the Putinese were saying that the guru is one absolute. Second, they were saying that the guru is omniscient. Third, they were saying because he's omniscient, he knows past, present, and future. So this all began from guru is absolute. Guru is omniscient. Guru knows everything past, present, and future. So what happened is a question came from somewhere. And the question was to the leader of this uh, group in Vrindavan, uh, because there are many, many, many people from the Hare Krishna movement were going and listening to lectures and, and, and whatnot of this particular preacher. I guess you can call him a preacher. Anyway, they were attending his discourses. And then there were many private talks. So someone asked the question that in the Hare Krishna movement, which was founded in the Western world uh, by A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, was he omniscient? And the guru of that group said, yes, Swamiji was omniscient. And then the further question was asked, does that, does that mean he knew past, present, and future? And the guru said, or the guru of that group said, yes, he knew past, present, and future. He was Trikala Gya. Okay, so you... Listeners out there, do you follow me up to this point? Uh, and it was also mentioned, the Guru is absolute, therefore he is omniscient, and he is Tri Kalagya. So then, a most difficult question was asked. Now, I don't know how many people were there, but this spread like fire at the time. The question was asked, if A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada was omniscient, Tri Kalagya, Did he know the children in the Gurukul at his time or in the future time were sexually molested? Did he know that this was going on? And did he know that this would be going on in the future? And the answer was given, yes, he knew. He knew because he is omniscient. And then the question was, well, why didn't he do something to stop this or prevent this from the future? Yeah, I mean, it, it, because let's get into the reasoning after I finish the story. And the answer was because it was the children's karma. Yeah. 
So, <laughs> are there any mothers or fathers out there watching <laughs> whose children were sexually molested in the guru pool? How do, can you settle with that? Prabhupada knew. He knew that this was happening. He knew that this was going to happen and further. And he did nothing because it was your child's karma. Now, that's another issue for a, a, a talk someday. Is everything karma? Everything you see happen in the world, is it simply karma? It's another discussion. But it, does that sit comfortably with you? Any mothers and fathers out there? Or let's just put it this way. Human beings out there, does that sit comfortably? That the guru knows that children are being molested, sexually abused, molested, physically abused in different ways, and he does nothing? He does nothing because it's their karma? That he even knows? Do you know that in the civil courts, I think it's called the civil courts, if you know that an act of pedophilia is going on, you know, you know. How you know is irrelevant, but you know. And you don't go to the authorities. You yourself will be pressed with criminal charges. That's how serious a crime child molestation pedophilia is. So from absolute omniscient, Trikalagya, he knows past, present, and future. He knew the children were being molested. Well, the whole train of thought is wrong. The position of the guru is both relative and absolute. And it's not an easy matter to wrap your head around. First off, because we're all disciples, and the disciple sees the guru as absolute. So when this happened many, many years ago, then I wrote an article called Omniscience, and you can find this in our website. We're going to put the uh, link down below after this talk is over. So I believe, Giri Maharaj, you have a copy of the article. Goswami, you also have a copy of the yes. article there. I want to go through this article and have you read things. First, uh, the question, uh, <clears throat> the question, and then the, 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 the first uh, paragraph, um, and so on. And second pair. Anyway, there's a lot of it. The whole article is uh, significant in this regard. Uh, so I, I, I want to go through that. Yeah, but bear in mind, we're talking about now mainly the omniscience. Is the acharya, is the spiritual master, is the guru omniscient? Omniscient meaning, does he know trikalagya? So <coughs> we want to go through this. And of course, I'm saying no, the guru is not. Uh, omniscient. Uh, partially, of course, but in the truest sense of the word omniscient, no, he's not omniscient. All right, so, um, but I'm sure this is going to ruffle more feathers than the first statement that the guru is not absolutely absolute. <laughs> this is probably going to even turn more fe ruffled feathers here. All right, so uh, Gary Moore, as you read the uh, the, the, or, or Goswami, you, you read the question. It starts at the top, says so question, and then yeah. uh, the, the, the first paragraph answer, and then Gary, I think I'll have you, you reading, and then I'll jump in, and we'll, we'll go through this and discuss this, all right? And I'll try to be as judicious and non-emotional and aggressive as possible. But I will say that when mean. this came out 15 years ago, my blood boiled. And I took it as a straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and I published this article and I spoke very openly and very aggressively against the idea as well as against the people who were propagating that idea. And I nearly got myself killed, actually. I received several death threats because I challenged what I considered to be one of the most offensive statements I have ever heard, and it was being supported by mis, uh, misunderstanding of Gaudiya Siddhanta. So it was, it was quite disturbing for me at the time, and it remains still disturbing, but I'll try to keep it under wraps today. Okay, Goswami, please, the question in the first paragraph and maybe the second paragraph also. 
Sure. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Is a pure devotee the guru or an acharya omniscient? Answer. There are two aspects of the guru, namely absolute and relative. On the inspired side, the guru is absolute, and within his own thinking, he is a devotee of Krishna. Our Shiksha Guru, Srila B.R. Sridhar, Dave Goswami Maharaj, explained this topic as follows. Quote, By the special will of Krishna, Guru Dave is a delegated power. If we look closely within the spiritual master, we will see the delegation of Krishna, and accordingly, we should accept him in that way. The spiritual master is a devotee of Krishna, and at the same time, the inspiration of Krishna is within him. These are the two aspects of Guru Dev. He has his aspect as a Vaishnava, and the inspired side of a Vaishnava is the Guru. On a fast day like a Kadasi, he himself does not take any grains. He conducts himself as a Vaishnava. But his disciples offer grains to the picture of their Guru on the altar. The disciple offers the spiritual master grains even on a fast day. Okay, let me comment a little bit about this uh, going forward. So, um, there are two aspects. We're saying here there are two aspects. Sridhar Mars is saying there are two aspects, excuse me, of the Acharya, of the Guru, and that's relative and absolute. So, the inspired side of the Guru is the, uh, the Krishna within him, representative of Krishna. Uh, that is the absolute side, and that's what the disciple sees. The relative side of the guru is he himself does not think of himself or see himself in that way. He sees himself as a disciple of his guru, and uh, or as a Vaishnava, as a devotee. And that's the relative aspect. So both aspects exist. And then he gives the example that on a codicy day, and let me bring this home to the fact, on a codicy day, Prabhupada did not take grains, did he? No, he didn't take grains. However, on the altar, on the altar, grains were offered to him. Now, some people will say, well, they were offered to him, to offer to his guru, to offer to his guru, to offer to him. And it goes up. But the point is, the grains were offered to him. And that is the absolute side. So both these things are visibly there in the thinking of the guru and also in how we relate to the guru. So... Goswami, please, the next paragraph, also by Srila Sridhar Maharaj. Mm -hmm. The disciple is concerned with the delegation of the Lord, the Guru's inner self, his inspired side. The inspired side of a Vaishnava is Acharya, or Guru. The disciple marks only the special, inspired portion within the Guru. He is more concerned with that part of his character. But Gurudev himself generally poses as a Vaishnava. So his dealings towards his disciples and his dealings with other Vaishnavas will be different. This is a Chinta Veda Veda, inconceivable unity and diversity. From Sri so, Guru and his grace. Yes, so this Chinta Veda Veda Tattva also means simultaneously one, absolute, and different, not absolute. It is the, it is the way... It, it is the foundation, it is the, to, well, the way Gaudiya Siddhanta is explained is simultaneously one and different. Yes, he is absolute. No, he's not. He's relative. He's both relative and absolute. There are various considerations. Now, I also want to inject at this point <coughs> that if we revert back to the discussion, is, is Srila Prabhupada relative or absolute, let's assume for the sake of discussion and argument, let's assume absolutely he's absolute. This business about relative and ab also relative, no. He's not relative. He's absolute. That's the end of it. Folded hands, bow your head. He's absolute. All right? So let's accept that uh, for, the, for, for the time being. All right? You agree? <laughs> I can't hear. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. It must be. Yeah. Coming. All right. Let's see how this turns out. Technology problems. Uh, so. Coming through slow, but we can. Yes. If 
Prabhupada is absolute. Is Bhakti Siddhanta absolute? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Is Bhakti Vinod absolute? Yeah. Yes. Is it fair to say then that all the Acharyas listed uh, in the list in the Gaudiya Sampradaya and the list that Prabhupada printed in his Bhagavad Gita, is it then fair to assume that all the Acharyas are absolute? Yep, yep. All right. We go all the way back to Lord Brahma. And he is certainly absolute. If everyone else is absolute, Lord Brahma must be absolute. He is the father of our Sampradaya. Correct? Yes, correct. Well, there's a chapter in the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's, it's known as uh, Brahma Vimohana Leela, the illusion of Brahma. Uh, this is in 10th Canto. Uh, there are other uh, instances of Brahma also w- where a brush, uh, Lord Brahma even chases after his own um, son, daughter. One of his sons. Huh? Daughter. Daughter. Chases after his own daughter. Agitated. Yeah. Remember, we're talking about Lord Brahma, the father of our Sampradaya. And this is recorded in Srimad Bhagavatam. So, never mind the, the earlier part about creation and him chasing his daughter in an agitated fashion. Well, let's move on to Krishna Leela and the uh, Brahma Vimohana Leela. Well, uh, Brahma is, it's called the illusion of Brahma. He, he takes Krishna as an ordinary human being. So many things happen there and he steals all the cowherd boys and he hides them away, away in a cave, correct? This is the story yeah, of Brahma. Mm-hmm. Uh, he later repents for that, offers beautiful prayers to Lord Krishna and whatnot. But uh, people say, oh, that's his Leela. Yeah, okay, that is in the Leela. And he's not acting there in an absolute capacity of one who knows everything. He's acting in illusion. It's called Brahma Vimohana Leela, the illusion of, illusion of Brahma. All right, so later on, after Srimad Bhagavatam is written, we come to the time period where Madhvacharya, who is another very important name in our Sampradaya, we are known as the Brahma Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya. Not, we're just not the Brahma Sampradaya. Madhva means through Madhva. Our Sampradaya comes through Madhvacharya. Mm-hmm. Well, when Madhvacharya said about his commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam, when he reached the chapter known as Brahma Vimohana Leela, he could not accept it. He could not accept that the father of his Sampradaya could not recognize Krishna and was in illusion, etc. And so he took that chapter out of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And if you go to Udupi today and go to the bookshops and ask for Madhvacharya's or anybody's edition from the Ashtamat, the eight mutts in in uh, in, uh, in Udupi, and ask for the Srimad Bhagavatam and go there and look, you'll see that that chapter has been taken out of the books. What he could not he could not digest, he could not accept that Brahma, the father of the Sampradaya, had been put into illusion. But Sridhar makes uh, Sridhar Maharaj, excuse me. Sri Maharaj makes the comment, and I quote that later in this article. Um, let me see. Where, what chap, what paragraph was that? Gary, you look for that as I try to explain here. Um, uh, Sri Maharaj says that Madhvacharya uh, uh, did not comment on this chapter, and that it actually means he, he, did, he didn't even include it. He took it out of the Srimad Bhagavatam. But then Sridhar Maharaj says, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he accepted that. Mm -hmm. And you will find in all the commentaries on Srimad Bhagavatam by the Acharyas and our Sampradaya, they all accept that and they all comment on that chapter also. So um, this is definitely an example of the uh, relative, relative position. And there are other positions, even the position of Vyasadeva himself, Sridhar Maharaj, 
he quotes here uh, Vyasa Veti Naveti Va. Vyasa may or may not know what he's even written. And then Sridhar Maharaj goes on to explain personal experiences, how Bhakti Siddhanta was giving a talk on Satyam. And during this talk, Bhakti Siddhanta realized, and Sridhar Maharaj exp explains this, and we'll read this, Sridhar Maharaj realized, oh, sorry, uh, Bhakti Siddhanta realized that something is flowing through him. He's giving explanation in such a way that he himself is not fully conscious of what he's saying. But this is coming, the absolute truth is coming down through him in such a way, a new experience, something that he himself does not have the experience of. And so Sridhar Maharaj was a senior devotee sitting there, and Bhakti Siddhanta um, uh, motioned to him like, write this down, write this down. And then he went on to speak, and, and, and Sridhar Maharaj explains that he was looking left and right for a pen and a paper. I don't have a pen, I don't have a pencil, I don't have a paper. And because he was searching and frantically looking around uh, and trying to get the host to bring some paper, he wasn't paying attention to what Bhakti Siddhanta was saying. So Bhakti Siddhanta, as the speaker, was not aware of really what it was, but he sensed that something profound is coming. He, it's coming through him. And Sridhar Maharaj recognized, yes, it is profound, but he didn't pay attention to it, and it was over. It didn't last for long. We can imagine, and he didn't say, but it was a few minutes, maybe, a few moments, maybe, only. But he said, Dante said, did you get it? Did you get it? And Sri Ramar said, no, I couldn't find a pen. And then he explains that not only did he not write it down, he didn't pay attention. And then Bhakti Siddhanta called him Gober Ganesh. So, uh, is this coming through? Can you hear me on the other side? Yeah, yeah, yeah we can find it. Okay, um, so something was coming. Mean, so it goes on from there, not just relative, yeah. absolute. The Vyas may or may not know. Um, something is coming down from Krishna <clears throat> through the Guru. The absolute is sending through the Guru, but the Guru himself not, might not even know that particular point at that moment. And actually, what was said was lost. Bhakti Siddhanta himself could not recall what he had said. There was no other qualified people in the room, apparently, at that time, to have grasped what he said. And Sri Ramaraj, when he was looking for a pencil, was not paying attention, got diverted, and he didn't get it. And Sri Ramaraj comments that his only solace was that he recognized that something very divine was descending. So what is that? What is that? Well, welcome to the mysticism of bhakti yoga. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, you know, rather than paraphrase, I, I, I'd like to read those things. Gary? Sure. So what's the first one, the first part to read? Uh, do you want to continue where we left off? No, I don't want to read the whole article. I just said I want to go to this point about Brahma Vimohana Leela. Where is it? I can't. It's the next to last page. What's the paragraph begin with? Well, commenting on the 10th canto. Okay, Gary, please read that. While commenting on the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Sripad Madhvacharya did not like to comment on the portion known as Brahma Vimohan Leela, the illusion of Brahma. In the conception of Madhvacharya, he could not accommodate that Brahma, the original Guru of Asampradaya, could be in illusion. Madhvacharya could not accommodate the conception of that Brahma did not know everything, that he was in illusion. But Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepted everything in Bhagavatam in toto. The following is stated in this regard by Srila Sridhar Maharaj in The Loving Search for the Lost Servant, page 50. So Srila Sridhar Maharaj says, So although Brahma and the other gods and gurus and the givers of many shastras may have given some description of his pastimes, we should have to realize that Krishna's pastimes are not bound by their descriptions. Given 
Brahma was bewildered whoa, whoa, in Krishna Lila. Whoa, 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 that completely broke up. You're, you're breaking up as well now for me. Technology. All right, I'm going to read that last paragraph again. So, although Brahma and other gods and gurus and the givers of many shastras may have given some description of Krishna's pastimes, we shall have to realize that Krishna's pastimes are not bound by their descriptions. Krishna is not confined in a cage. Yes. Very, very profound. So there you have the, the statement there. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. <clears throat> that um, I, I'm going to read the rest of them because I think it's, it's a matter of some, somehow the, the technology of what we're doing here just doesn't work so powerfully uh, and breaks up. All right. So Sridhar Maharaj continues. So for this reason, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not hesitate to give a description of the bewilderment of Brahma. Brahma Vimohana Lila. Brahma was bewildered in Krishna Lila in Vrindavan. And, and, and again, when Brahma went to have an interview with Krishna in Dwarka, we find the same condition. So that's when Brahma went with four-headed Brahma and 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 then said, well, what Brahma is I? It's, it's all about me, right? I'm the only Brahma, right? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Krishna showed, no, you were just one little Brahma. That's <laughs> the father of our Sampradaya. In numerous cases, the relative position is 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 shown in the course of a Leela. So... We find there the same condition. The boundary of the sweet will of the infinite is such that anything, anything can be accommodated there. And even Lord Brahma, the creator of the universe, can be perplexed by Krishna. So that is not to say that the guru, the acharya, or Brahma will be perplexed by this material world, but it does demonstrate the relative position of the guru. That's the whole point here, what um, is being explained in this article, and I'm referencing, referencing what Srila Sridhar Maharaj has explained. Now, this was a very big point. It's included in Sri Guru and His Grace, and um, this was a very important book back in the day and remains so today to clarify many things about the Guru Tattva and Gaudiya Siddhanta. Many things, aspects and relations between uh, Guru and God brothers, and Guru and disciple, and Guru to his Guru, and those who had one initiation from Prabhupada, but a second initiation from one of the initiating Gurus, and all these complex relationships, uh, which for the most part were completely misunderstood after the disappearance of his divine grace. Um, were explained for the benefit of the devotees in Sri Guru and His Grace in 1979, 1980, and 81, etc. <coughs> that book <coughs> and the knowledge therein and the proper understanding therein is the basis of the proper conception of Guru Tattva. Shiksha Guru also. But you see in the world so many misunderstandings. So, you know, it, it's, it's not a debate in Gaudiya Siddhanta, is the guru relative or absolute? It's, it's not a debate. Those who are the acharyas, those who are the... Uh, yes, let's just say it that way. Those who are the acharyas in the Gaudiya Sampradaya all agree that the position of the acharya is both relative and absolute, not simply absolute. And this instance where absolute leads to omniscience, omniscience, the street called a and then this leads to Prabhupada knew everything, including the children are being molested. Just see where this goes, how, how this happens. And do you know what? There are other branches of Vaishnavism that, have, that use these misunderstandings that are prominent in the Hare Krishna world. They use these misunderstandings 
to take people away. Or they don't even try to take them away. They just present the correct understanding and a, and a light goes on uh, in many people's head and in their way of thinking and they end up uh, leaving Prabhupada's institution and going uh, somewhere else. They're not even trying to canvas. Um, I received three emails today, early in the morning. They're all from the same person, a Prabhupada disciple. Um, and he was suggesting to me all these different things that the, 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 the GBC body has to do uh, to correct themselves, this, that, and the other. And he was suggesting that, uh, that I make reference to all of these things. So I haven't replied to him yet, but I'm going to. And in my reply, I'm... <laughs> I'm going to say that, well, one is I have no intention of correcting um, the GBC. I have no intention of correcting the GBC. What to speak of, he suggests, saving this <laughs> God. I have no intention of even trying to correct the GBC or save this God. Neither am I interested in it. So some of them say, well, what are you interested in? Oh, I'm interested in the correct understanding. And like I said, the incorrect understanding on many things, and we're just getting started about Guru Tattva, uh, and every Tattva that there is in Gaudiya Siddhanta, that the Western world of Hare Krishna has got either only a partial understanding, or a partial understanding with a wrong un understanding mixed with it, or a complete misunderstanding. So... I'm not trying to save anything. I'm just doing what my duty is, and that's to preach what my gurus have taught to me. And it just so happens it comes in contrast, or contradiction to what many people believe or think Gaudiya Siddhanta is. So, if anything, I was trying. If any, if, if 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 I had to admit that I'm trying to save something, it would just be the proper understanding, uh, uphold the proper Siddhanta. I'm not trying to save anybody's institution or or influence anybody's institution. I'm simply preaching what is the Siddhanta in the institution that I belong to, which is the Brahma Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya, and that is taught to be my taught to me by my gurus, Sri the Prabhupada, Sri the Sridhar Maharaj, Sri the Puri Maharaj. So. Alright, so there's more to read here, and since your voices were breaking up, okay, can you still hear me? Yep. Yeah. I'm gonna continue the reading. Uh, continuing, Sridhar Maharaj, Srila Sridhar Maharaj says, All these pastimes are like so many lighthouses, showing us which way to go. Brahma is our guru, but he was bewildered by Krishna. And Vyasadeva, the universal teacher, the universal guru, was also chastised by Narada Muni. Narada was put to the test many times. All these examples are showing us the way. They are pointing out the direction. Well, I have to say, add here, what direction? The relative and absolute position of the devotee, of the Vaishnava, of the Acharya, of the Guru, of Vyasadeva himself, the presenter of the Vedas. Where is that chapter? Uh, what, uh, what, what paragraph? Is uh, is about Vyas and Vyas of the Viti Va. Tell me, so I, so I can find it. So that's talking about Guru Maharaj. It starts the higher thinking devotees. Let me get to that. Uh, okay, let me read something here. Is that where it begins? Yes. All right, it begins here. Um, The higher thinking devotees, that, that's a statement I'm making. Okay? In the article, that's my statement. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll begin to read that, and then we'll get into what Srila Sri Ramaraj has said. And I think there's one or two of my own statements connecting these paragraphs. Okay? So, um, so that begins here. The higher thinking devotees. Now, who, who, who am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about my gurus. That's who I'm talking about. I'm not talking about myself. The higher thinking devotees and great authorities in the devotional line think in a completely different way than the neophytes. Hmm? 
I might add here that once when Achyutananda Prabhu uh, uh, witnessed, and I think other devotees were there, a conversation between uh, Srila Prabhupada and Srila Sriramar, the conversation was mainly in Bengali. Uh, I think you will both remember this. Uh, and uh, afterwards, Achyutananda inquired from um, um, Srila Prabhupada, oh, what were you and Sridhar Maharaj talking about, Srila Prabhupada? What was, what were you talking about? And Srila Prabhupada paused for a minute and said, I'm paraphrasing, Sridhar Maharaj has very high realizations. If you heard them, you would faint. Remember that. <laughs> Prabhupada is saying, and the Chutananda is the reference, and so we can do our research and confirm that with the Chutananda Prabhu, or anybody out there can confirm that with the Chutananda Prabhu, that indeed, and I'm pretty sure it was Chutananda, indeed, uh, Prabhupada said, Sridhar Maharaj has very high, by Prabhupada's estimation, Sridhar Maharaj has very high realizations, which he had just then been discussing. But he said to his disciple, Achyutananda, and Achyutananda was a senior disciple of Srila Prabhupada, no doubt. Uh, if anyone knows the time period and the personalities and all this, you will know that Achyutananda was the, uh, was uh, amongst the, ranked amongst the most senior disciples of Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada told him, but if you hear, what Sri Dharmaras, it will you will faint. It will shock you. You will faint. What does that mean? Well, because your realization, although it's right up there as top disciple of Srila Prabhupada in the present Hare Krishna movement, compared to Sri Maharaj, well, you will faint. You will be shocked. But in a good way, if you can digest. Okay. All right, so I wrote that opening paragraph. And then I quote the verse, Aham vedmi sukho veti vyaso veti naveti va. Now we quote Sri Sri Maharaj. I know the true purpose of Bhagavatam. Oh, this is the uh, uh, Sri Maharaj's translation of that verse. Aham vedmi sukho veti vyaso veti naveti va. Sri Maharaj's translation is thus. Quote, I know the true purpose of the Bhagavatam. Sukadev, the son and disciple of Vyasadev, he knows it thoroughly. And the author, the author of Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Vyasadev, he may or may not know the meaning. Vyasadev, the author of Bhagavatam, he may not know the meaning. End of quote. Now, <clears throat> Srila Sridhar Maharaj says here, I'm quoting now. Well, I'm paraphrasing. Vyas may or may not know. Vyaso veti naveti va. This is the thinking of the higher class of devotees. By the will of the Supreme Lord, a flow of knowledge may come down in the Vaishnava. But even he may not be aware of its meaning. Such is possible. He may or may not know. Vyaso veti naveti va. Now, we, we referenced the story of Bhakti Siddhanta. Something was coming down. Something of a very high nature that he himself was not aware of. Uh, in, at least in the sense of how it was being explained. It was flowing through him. And he was not fully aware. So the Sridhar Maharaj has related an incident in this regard that once, oh, yes, here it is, while Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was delivering a lecture, an especially high flow of Gaudiya Siddhanta came down in him. While speaking very intensely, Saraswati Thakur gestured to Sridhar Maharaj, who was sitting nearby, to write it down. Saraswati Thakur continued to speak for some time, but there was no pencil or pen available. When Saraswati Thakur stopped speaking, he turned to Srila Sridhar Maharaj and eagerly inquired, Did you get it? Did you get it? 
Sridhar Maharaj replied that there was no pen or pencil available, to which Saraswati Thakur replied, just see, Gober Ganesh. <laughs> okay, now Srila Sridhar Maharaj relates this incident, incident in his own words. Now we have a quote directly from Srila Sridhar Maharaj. Quote, what I told you, it is not under my command. It is coming from above. I also once heard Prabhupada say such. From Vrindavan, he came to Prayag. I also went with him. And we were invited and went to a big man's uh, place. Such a beautiful place. And there new things came out that I was feeling very much disturbance that I could not note them. So much so that I could not attend his lecture also deeply. In other words, he, he was not able to pay attention. Only I felt much disturbance to get the pen and paper. Then I felt very much uneasiness because I could not mark those words. Then I came out and Guru Maharaj told his words, your Gober Ganesh. That is Ganesh made of gober. Gober means cow dung. Ganesh composed of gober. He could, he, Saraswati Thakur, could not know these things, these thoughts that came in him. Even I felt the necessity of going through these things, these ideas afterwards, but it was lost. That person in whose house Bhakti Siddhanta went to visit was technically known as that section who worships Satyam. Then what is the concept of Satya? Mahaprabhu and Radha Govinda, Nabadweep, that is the highest conception of Satya. Satya is not an abstract conception of rules of some transcendental type. Satya is not such. What is the relation of Krishna and this Satya. That Saraswati Thakur was to explain. And he told us that the thoughts that came at that time, that he also wants to see it. What an inspiration. What was revealed in his heart at that time, he wanted to see. That was unknown to him. He said like that. He told us like that. But they are a stranger to me, what is coming. But they passed through me, and I want to see that. Yes, that's mysticism in Bhakti Yoga. The flow of the Absolute coming down through the Acharya, what he is speaking. This doesn't happen every day. Ooh, by far, not every day. It might even happen once or something in a lifetime. That what he begins to speak, Krishna sends through him that he himself does not know has not yet understood, yet it is coming through him, the Absolute. And he wants to know that. So that particular thing, whatever it was that Bhakti Siddhanta was explaining about Satyam was so new, so inspiring, so beautiful, that he wanted to taste it and relish it afterwards because he was unaware of really what it was. And only by reviewing it would he, the Vaishnav, the relative side, actually be able to grasp what it was. So, when we say the Guru is absolute, and certainly the Guru is absolute, but not in all circumstances. He does not think of himself as absolute. When that absolute Krishna becomes fully manifest there, then amazing things will happen that even the Guru himself, as a Vaishnava, the relative aspect of that same entity, will be amazed and may not know. And so forth. And this is repeated throughout Gaudiya, Chinta Beta Beta, that for philosophy. Simultaneously one and different. Not just in Guru, but in so many things. Simultaneous. One and different. Absolute and relative. But the main topic of this talk was omniscience. And I'm going to get on to the end of this article. And I would request our listeners uh, that if you're interested in this topic of omniscience, uh, please 
refer to the link which we will be posting below when this article is posted on YouTube and on Facebook. And uh, go, go there and, and, and read the article in its entirety. So, the last page of this article, let's read as such. Omniscience, or sometimes referred to as omniscience. Omniscience is a quality of the Supreme Lord, and not the quality of the Jiva soul, or even of the Guru. The Supreme Lord has a total of 64 transcendental qualities. The Jiva souls, however, have only 50 of those qualities found in the Supreme Lord, and only manifest those qualities in a minute quantity. Among the 50 qualities that the part and parcel Jivas have, omniscience is not listed among these 50 qualities. So that list, I believe, is in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu and possibly in other places also, but for sure. I believe Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu or more commonly known in the West as the Nectar of Devotion. Above these 50 qualities, the Supreme Lord has five more qualities which sometimes partially manifest in personalities like Lord Shiva. These transcendental qualities are changeless, all cognizant, ever fresh, such an ananda, possessing an eternal blissful body. And five, possessing all mystic perfections. All, cosmic, all co cognizant means to know everything or to be omniscient. One who possesses omniscience is omniscient, all cognizant. And that means personalities like Lord Shiva. Uh, and, of course, Krishna. Additionally, um, okay. all, cos all, all cos cognizant means to know everything or to be omniscient. According to Srila Rupa Goswami, this is a quality that even the perfected Jiva souls do not have. Only Krishna is fully omniscient. Only Krishna, or God, knows everything. Additionally, it may be mentioned that according to the Webster's Dictionary, the synonyms for the word omniscient or omniscience are as follows. God, the Creator, the Almighty, the Supreme Being, our Heavenly Father, the Lord, and get this, and Allah. So maybe we should ask the Webster's Dictionary to add Vishnu and Krishna. So, it's kind of funny. Well, not funny. There you have it. Webster's Thesaurus Dictionary gives us the synonyms for omniscient, and it is all about God, the Supreme, Almighty, Our Father. Uh, so I think it's both, it's both, you know, but what happened, it's both common sense as well as a spiritual fact and a siddhanta in Gaudi Vaishnavism. Omniscience is not a quality of the jiva. However, it was pointed out to me this morning with some references and conversation between Jayadvita and Srila Prabhupada and also Sri Maharaj is saying, yes, some omniscience may be manifest in even an ordinary jiva, what to speak of the guru. Some omniscience. But omniscience in the fullest extent of the world, it, it's not a fact. I mean, otherwise, how? you can digest that, you can accept that. Prabhupada is absolute, Prabhupada is omniscient. I'm not speaking to any particular person except that group who was, who was preaching openly and publishing articles 15 years ago. Uh, that Prabhupada is absolute, Prabhupada is omniscient. He's treat Kalagya, he knows past, present, and future, therefore he knew the children were being molested. Really? Do you really think so? Do you really think so? You know, there was one incident where 
somebody, I don't know who it was, there was some term, I was in Africa at the time, so it must have been 72, three. And somebody in the New York temple stole $5,000. Well, if I didn't know they stole the money, it was a devotee, the disciple. Prabhupada didn't know they stole it until they told him. But then you could have seen, well, maybe he didn't. Maybe he was om- he's omniscient, he didn't. Okay, let's say he didn't know. He was omniscient, he knew. But when they finally told him, do you know what he responded? I think he responded this in a letter to Gopal Krishna, who was uh, not a Maharaj at that time. Now Gopal Krishna, Maharaj in Delhi, in India. I believe it was him, I'm not sure. But Prabhupada responded, and said, have him arrested. Have that devotee arrested. He stole $5,000 from Krishna, from the temple. Have him arrested. Okay? Now let's add one and one and two. That's one and, let's add one and one and see what we get. Prabhupada is omniscient or regardless, but when he finds out some money was stolen, he says, have him arrested. On the other side, Prabhupada is absolute, he's omniscient. He knows that the children are being molested, but he does nothing. It's their karma. These people said, well, the reason Swamiji didn't do anything because it was the children's karma. So they're putting words into Prabhupada's mouth, but this is what they were saying. So it's their karma. So let me add it together. Children are being molested, he knows it. That's their karma. Money is being stolen. Oh, he gets upset about that and wants them arrested. What What do you think a third party would say? Any judge, jury, or decent human being in the world would say, oh, we have a person who knows children being molested, but he does nothing about it. But when his money is stolen, he's ready to have uh, even one of his own disciples arrested. What do you think of such a person? Because one and one equals two, two and two equals four. You add these things together and unwittingly and unknowingly, and then some people even knowingly, are painting a historical picture of Srila Prabhupada that is so out of focus. It's outrageous. It's got to make your blood boil, people. you got to... I mean, so, uh, Shil Prabhupada, Shil Prabhupada says it right in this conversation with uh, Jaya Dwaita Swami at the end of it. Jaya Dwaita says, Sometimes the Acharya may seem to forget something or not know something. So from our point of view, if someone has forgotten, that is an imperfection. Prabhupada says, Then you do not understand. Acharya is not God. Not omniscient. He is a servant of God. His business is to preach the bhakti cult. That is Acharya. And this is important. So then Jayadweta says, that is the perfection. Prabhupada says, yes, that is the perfection. Then he says, Jayadweta, so we have a misunderstanding about what perfection is. Prabhupada said, yes, perfection is here. How he is preaching the bhakti cult. I'm going to have to ask you to read that again. And, and I would have to say, listen up, everybody, including me with my big old ears, you know. <laughs> listen up. What is his divine grace saying? Read that whole section again, and <laughs> with folded hands, I bow my head, and that's it. Who is not absolute, who is not omniscient. Okay? And the, the reference is in Mayapur, April 75. Okay? April 8th, 1975. You can find it in the folio. So Jayadwaita Maharaj says, Sometimes the Acharya may seem to forget something or not know something. So from our point of view, if someone has forgotten, that is an imperfection. Mm-hmm. Prabhupada replies, Then you do not understand. Acharya is not God, not omniscient. He is the servant of God. His business is to preach the bhakti cult. That is Acharya. Jayadwaita 
And that is the perfection. Prabhupada, yes, that is the perfection. How he is preaching the bhakti cult. That's end. Period. Prabhupada says that's all. Okay. So that should, for everyone out there, who bows their head at the lotus feet of A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada. The issue of the position of the Acharya as relative and absolute is not simply absolute. He is both relative and absolute. And he is not omniscient. He is not God. He does not have this care, the quality of God as uh, uh, being omniscient. I mean, this is not a debate. This is not a court case. But if it were, at this point, I would pick up my, uh, I would stand in front of the judge and say, Your Honor, we rest our case. In fact, you can strike everything I have said before this and just run with this last statement of Srila Prabhupada. And I think you've got a very clear understanding of the position of the guru. And I think you also... If you listen closely, you'll hear him say, yes, you do not understand. And that misunderstanding persists even to the present day, and it is a root cause of... <laughs> you cannot list the problems, especially when you take them to an individual level. You cannot list the problems that have occurred within the Hare Krishna movement, uh, both during the time of Srila Prabhupada and especially after the disappearance of His Divine Grace, from just this one, one aspect of incorrect understanding of the Guru Tattva and the Gaudiya Siddhanta. So gentlemen, do you have anything else to add to today's conversation? Otherwise we wrap it up with about one hour. Goswami, nope. Giri, anything to read? Any further comment? No, that was wonderful. Wow. That was really good. Thank you for coming up with that reference this morning. The folio can prove to be invaluable. That was Gary Myers, his research, as, as usual. Yes, he's the incarnation of research, that's for sure. <laughs> is there a name for that? <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll, we'll invent one. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Maharajas, and thank you much, uh, all the devotees, uh, however, whoever, wherever was listening to today's talk, will be posted up on YouTube in just a few minutes, and uh, uh, we invite you to uh, please do, you know, do the thing, give us a like, uh, subscribe, ding, ring the bell so you get notifications, and share with your friends. And leave your comments below if you have any, or if you have any questions, or if you have uh, any objections. Uh, we do not disclose names. Oh, just before we go, say one more thing. Uh, someone wrote in a message yesterday um, in regard to our first uh, broadcast, which we called Opening Statement. And there we brought up this uh, relative absolute, and that's kind of what started this thing going there. And I mentioned, uh, you know, a, a relative statement. Prabhupada said Balavanta would be present. Well, this young lady, I assume a young lady, if she's not initiated, wrote and mentioned that she had read in one of the memoirs mm -hmm. of uh, Harisari Prabhu, uh, who's published his memoirs in a number of books. Uh, personally, I haven't seen any of those books in years. I don't know. But she says, she didn't give the exact reference, but she says that Hari Sari Prabhu explains there that Prabhupada did not say that Balavanta would be president of the United States. So that was quite refreshing, and that is uh, put yet another topic on our list that we'll get around to eventually, and that topic is called Prabhupada Said, because, uh, well, there are just a lot of Prabhupada Says out there. And uh, all of them really aren't, he said, actually. They're something else. But they have become known as Prabhupada said. So I was very uh, happy and thankful to this uh, young lady for pointing this out. And if I have the opportunity, I would like to see it. What is the reference there? 
um, the, the Hari Sari saying Prabhupada did not say that. So that's 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 welcome news to my ears. I think it should be welcome news to anybody's ears. Uh, but it is also a fact that many of us have heard that just kind of said in conversation. Oh, Prabhupada said, or in a class, Prabhupada said. And uh, with that, I leave you with the Prabhupada said. There are many Prabhupada said. So we'll look into that as a topic at another time. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for watching. And uh, until next time, which should be, I think, tomorrow morning, same time, same channel. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.